Hello there. My name is Julian van der Bos, and today I'm going to talk about referencing in research. Why do we use it? How do we use it? Um, I'm, just, I'm going to keep it short. I'm just going to give you the main ideas behind it. Why do we do these things? But I'm not going to give you examples on how to format your text. God, no. Uh, you can always look that up if you need to. So what is this class going to be about? It's going to be understanding different referencing systems. It's going to be about understanding and differentiating between the needs of institutions, scholars, and other readers uh, when assessing or contemplating these uh, referencing systems. And then actually the final realization is that academic traditions change slowly. And that's where most of us are still stuck with, yeah, impractical, impractical, impractical uh, referencing systems. So, First, I'm going to talk about the references themselves, uh, then about the systems, and then about the styles. Uh, so it's going to be very quick. Uh. So why do we use references? Uh? I've encountered students, and even young PhD students, that actually cannot answer that question. Um, many think, or some think, uh, I'll put it like this, some people think that we just do this to make it look more scholarly to make our text look, look, uh, look more um, yeah, important, uh, scientific. Uh, that's why we add these things. But it's actually not true. Um, and this is, in here you see the, 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 div the division between the exact sciences and the humanities. Because somebody in exact sciences would never say, why do we use references? Because if you're working with experiments, you need to know exactly what are the parameters, what are the, 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 uh, the settings of different aperture and, and, and measures in order to recreate an element, an experiment. Uh, how to re, uh, redo an experiment and test it again and see if they were correct and uh, what if you tweak this little element or this parameter or this element. Huh? Then that's how you do that in, when you're working with experimental science, right? And so they know that these references are key elements to know what the settings are, what are the references, what are the, um, the, 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 the parameters of another scholar's research. And in humanities, we don't use experiments that much, but our references are exactly the same. Because here we re refer to other people's concepts, their way of thinking, their conclusions, their assumptions. So all of these things need to be included in our research so other people can recreate what we are actually doing. And so why do we re do use references? Is not to make our uh, text more fancy or look more important. Uh, it's actually somebody that actually wants to come to the same conclusions as us. Uh, that wants to do exactly the same thing. They can read all the same materials they can read your argumentation and how you link these things, and they should come to the same conclusion if your argumentation is sound. Uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But for them also, they need to know where you get some ideas from. And so they can actually go back and check these texts out to, to understand you better, to, be go, uh, to go beyond your words, uh, to hear you out, to hear not only what you're saying, but what you mean by these things, by reading your sources. That's why we use references. Yeah? And this is the only way that we can actually, through writing, communicate with one another as scholars within uh, uh, different academia uh, uh, and, and uh, academic communities and, and pass on knowledge to one another that can be verified, that can be checked. Yeah? If you wouldn't use your references, first of all, they wouldn't know what you invented, what others invented. And what is true, what do you use, uh, on what tradition you base, what are your uh, hidden biases, and so on. So references are absolutely necessary in order to recreate research. And if you cannot recreate it, we cannot test it, we cannot improve upon it, and we cannot validate it and, and, and accept it if, if we cannot check it. Right. So that's why references are so important. So what kind of referencing systems do we have? Well, here I made three examples uh, based on some um, Latin generic text, uh, just to make my point clear. So the first one, uh, this one, uh, as you can see, this is def uh, definitely one with in-text references, right? Uh, so the 
the sources are listed the, directly after uh, the text uh, or a piece of text, the element of text to which they refer. The second one is footnotes. So here we see that uh, we have different um, numbers that can be a little bit higher. I, I just like the, the settings in, in, in uh, PowerPoint don't work so well, so I'm doing it like this. And then at the bottom of the page, we have the references themselves, right? And then the last one is what we call endnotes. It's once again, you work with, um, with uh, numbers, but only at the end of the text, you have a full list of all uh, the references. Huh? Of course, there are two kinds of footnotes or endnotes. You have informative footnotes that give more information about a certain element. Huh? I'm not referring to these. These are only referring to sources, huh? to, what, to a list what is in the end your bibliography. Huh? So here you make short references in the text, and then you have a bibliography at the end or list of references and listing them all. Here you have the sources listed directly at the bottom of the page. And either they can also be shorter forms uh, with a full reference list at the end, or they can be the full reference already behind the text, depending what, what system you use, and then the final one. So what's the idea? What's Why do we have these three different reference systems? Well, most people don't think about it. They just use them, whatever they have to do. They don't think why we have these three systems. Well, first of all, uh, and notes are probably one of the oldest for the simple reason is when research was still typed on typewriters uh, it was very hard to lay out eh, because you're writing your text and then you have all these sources so what did they do they would just insert numbers whenever they had a footnote and only when the text was finished when it was typed uh, typed they would give the full list of all the remarks which they had made in handwritten notes and type them out one by one by the numbers so it had certain advantages. On the one hand, you're not bothered by reading them while you're reading the text. On the other hand, you have to go to the back of the page, to the back of the chapter, or the back of the work in order to find the full list. Yeah? Of course, you can copy them, take them out, compare them. But if it's a, a, like a physical book, it's difficult. You always have to go back and forth. Yeah? But the reason was theses and papers used to be written on typewriters. And it was so much more difficult to do footnotes at that time. Yeah? Because if you make uh, footnotes and you want to add something else, you have no space to squeeze it in, but the reference you can just retype the page and, and, and yeah. Huh? If you do it at the end, you know that you're already finished and, and uh, you can do it this way. So that's the idea behind endnotes. Footnotes, of course, is also for making the reading easier. So here you have the reference at the bottom of the page. So they don't bother you while you're reading the text. Huh? So you just have the number and at the bottom you have exactly what you need. This is very nice uh, because you can easily see if it's a reference or an informative footnote at the same page that you're looking at, uh, like in the middle example here. But the problem is if you have very long references, the, your, the amount of text you can put on a page becomes very short and like the amount of footnotes becomes, yeah, the, the proportion of your notes becomes quite big. And this also goes a bit against yeah, uh, the readability because you have one paragraph or maybe two paragraphs and all the rest are footnotes. And then the next page, or you have very long footnotes that go from one page to another to another. This is sometimes aesthetically, it's not the best. Uh? So depending, sometimes it makes sense to, end, uh, to opt for end notes. Uh? And then the other system in which you have in-text references, well, this is useful because you use a short reference, usually the author name and the year of the publication and the page number. Uh, just to refer like this is the reference. On the one hand, it bothers with reading. On the other hand, uh, since we're all publishing our stuff digitally and we're tracking the amount of citations, institutions find, find this system very useful to see what text has been citing, what sources, when and how often and on what page, uh, because the source is directly linked already to the text. So this is easy to find and recreate these systems. Huh? So they all have their advantages, huh? but um, yeah, there's different needs here. For institutions, the first one, and for tracking the metrics of who is being cited, when and by who, this is the easiest. Huh? Uh, the footnotes are definitely the most readable. And then the endnotes are still have some value if the, uh, the notes themselves are not that relevant for the text and I would only bother if they're at the bottom of every text. Uh, it makes sense to put them at the ends. Many, uh, many publishers do that. Huh? So if you have your own monograph in your own book, then your ideas matter most and your sources are actually, yeah, secondhand is 
nice for people who want to check that but for the general reader who wants to read what you are saying and how you are putting your thoughts together and argumenting they don't need to see your reference all the time so they can have that in endnotes huh? but also depends on the public who are you um, offering this to huh? um, also for policy makers the notes go to the end they only care about your conclusions your text huh? so every system has its yeah its benefits when it comes to readability uh, uh, parsimoniousness, uh, the amount of uh, like how clear they, they they show their sources, and also um, yeah how how you can add informative footnotes, uh, for instance, because if your informative footnotes which matter are all at the end, like in the third example, yeah this makes it difficult to actually link them back because nobody's going to read them because everybody's going to expect them just to be references. That's the thing with endnotes, you you don't know where you're going to get. So you think, oh, this is an interesting thought. Uh, this, this, say you're reading this first line. Say, oh, this is an interesting thought. I want to know what this is about. And you go at the end, you don't know what you're going to get. Is, are you going to get a reference? Are you going to get an informative footnote that is going to change the way how you think about this? Or just, oh, somebody else also wrote this, like some, some bullshit information you actually didn't need. So endnotes is, you know, uh, it's like ringing somebody's bell and running away. Uh, like they're going to open, but they don't know what they're going to find. Uh. Um, with footnotes, it's more clear up front. Uh, like with one look at the bottom of the page, you know what this is about and you can choose to read or not. And it doesn't really bother the reading process. But then for institutions, for qualifying who's citing who, in-text references is also, uh, and it's also quite easy to make for authors. So it's also as an example. Uh, especially if you're using systems with EBDEM and you have the like that you use Latin abbreviations to refer to footnotes so you don't have to write them in full or with endnotes. If you switch your text around as an author, then you have to make sure that all your footnotes line up and update as well. If you use in text references, you just repeat the reference. You're not going to write EBDEM, you're just going to uh, write the same reference because it's already short. So there's no point in shortening it twice by shortening it in Latin or using a substitute for that. So this is easier to edit text. Thank God they are reference managers that uh, allow you to work with all three styles. Uh, I'll probably do a video about those as well, but uh, there are so much videos out on, on YouTube that, that you can check out by yourself. So this is why we have the different systems and this is their yeah, raison d'etre, as they say, their reasons of existence. So uh, why do we have different referencing styles? Uh, so here we have a couple examples of the, the American uh, Psychology Association style, if I'm not mistaken, Chicago style, Harvard style, the MLA style. Uh, so these are very common styles within humanities. Uh, this is one of my publications, one of my old months, and you see the small differences in how they are cited. Well, why do we use these different styles? And actually, um, there is, yeah, the answer here is actually not so much to do with. Uh, because we have good computers that can track down all these referencing systems and, and find out what's the author's name, what's the title. So even within these different systems, or if we would move to one universal system, it doesn't matter. Uh, we have smart machines that can figure this stuff out. So why are we still sticking to all of these styles and some are like uh, more difficult and so on? It actually has to do with these two thoughts. Uh, like the first one is the academic world is an archipelago. Right, so it's a different set of small islands. Each are their own community. They have their own little traditions. They're all influenced by one another because they're next to one another. But still, they have their own thing and they want to do that. So if I have the style that I have been using for a long time as a tradition, they're gonna keep using it and gonna keep forcing on. And this is passed on from promoter to a PhD student. And when they become a professor, they do the same. Many people don't actually reflect on this and just pass these things on. Of course. Different journals have their own style, and they they, they, they keep this. They, they they will not switch this around if something works for them, and they have a system in, in, in checking these things, and they're gonna keep it. So that's was as an as an author, you have to be a bit of a chameleon. You have to understand these different systems, know the differences, and being able to, yeah, uh, do the the, the dotting your uh, eyes and crossing your t's, and make sure that they they are formally correct everywhere. But the other thought is like science advances one funeral at a time. As long as if you have a community which you have traditional um, leading authors, leading authorities that are traditionalist, that feel that this is part of their tradition, how they've always doing, and they will have enough power within the community to maintain this tradition. Well, as long as they are alive uh, and, and influential, uh, you will be you will be forced as a younger scholar PhD student to adhere to this 
their traditions and doing it the same way. So even if there is actually almost no difference between these different styles, if your if your institution has a house style, if your institution has a preferred style within their discipline, you probably will be nudged or arm wrestled into uh, following this. Uh, and that also shows that the academic community, we're humans, right? So we have our own biases, preferences. None of these things, not all of these things are rational, right? And some of them are really just like um, like relics of, of, of older times as, as uh, the end node system that has actually was invented when people were still, you know, riding on typewriters, right? But still, that's how we work. We are humans. And uh, that's why we are still bothering with all these styles and doing them. Once again, there are different reference managers that can adapt to most of these styles. Often in those, you can even program your own specific styles if you have a specific style in your home country, which is culturally defined. And uh, so check them out and make sure that uh, you find something that's useful for you. And uh, you also find that many of them are actually uh, free of charge. So as a PhD student with a small budget, uh, this shouldn't be a problem to actually find one, test it out and use it and win days and days of work instead of doing all of this stuff manually. Yeah? So this is me over and out. Do check out my other videos uh, because I hope that these things are useful to you. Uh, these are small tidbits of information or stuff that I've gathered over the years. But um, I don't know. Some of the stuff is obvious and some of the stuff just gives you a spider a slightly different perspective on stuff that you actually know and your, your gut feeling, you know, you can get along with it. It's not rocket science, but still, it gives you something to think about. Yeah? Thank you again and over and out.